What's up, Erie? So my name is Samantha Geitz. That's my face. I'm sure you all saw me on Twitter, that picture that's up there that's attached to this conference. I had been out with my coworkers for our on-site the night before and was super hungover. So I was like really excited to get like a better face up for you all to see. Like, um, so anyway, I have been doing this for a long time, like since the Geo Cities days when I was in like fifth grade and I was getting street cred. But I've been doing this professionally since about 2011. And this talk is about a lot of mistakes I've made in my career. Um, <laughs> so I was originally an English literature major and was going to be a high school English teacher and went through all my English coursework and then got into the education program and went, oh, I hate teenagers. This was a terrible idea. <laughs> so in my last semester of college, I, I took an, a computer science course as an elective and realized, oh, okay, cool, this is what I want to do when I grow up. So I self-taught for a couple of years, went back, I got a master's degree in um, information science, did some freelancing. Um, since then, I've been around a couple different agencies. I worked in the Chicago startup scene for a couple of years. Um, so yeah, I've got kind of a, a variety of backgrounds here. Um, now I work for this company, Titan. I've been there for two and a half years. Um, we're a Laravel shop. We do a lot of Vue and React as well. So if at any point you're looking for Laravel work done, either Greenfield or you have an existing horrible app that you want us to make better for you, um, definitely hit us up because um, we're pretty good at what we do. So I worked with a lot of cool people, um, a lot of a lot of big companies. Um, so before you're all like at me on Twitter, like what about scalability? Like it is something that I've I've done before. <laughs> so. We're gonna talk about you for a minute. So I want everyone to stand up. This is the third talk. I know we're like coming up on lunch, so everyone stand up here. Okay, so if you have been a professional in the industry, and I don't mean like, you know, I'm talking about like I started with like GeoCities. Like no, people have been paying you to write code for less than a year. Sit down. Okay, can we actually like give a round of applause to these people because this is probably their first conference, and if someone near you just sat down, like, find them and say hi, because it can be really scary being at your first tech conference when you feel like you know what you're doing. Um, okay, so one to three years. Okay? You guys are the ones who are going to feel very personally attacked by this, so I apologize in advance, and you can come talk to me after if you, like, need to talk about your feelings. Um, three to five years. More than five. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, say five to ten. Five to ten. Good call. Thank you. I'm doing this backwards from the way I originally intended. I'm like, no, I should just give a shout out. Okay, five to 10. So everyone who's still standing is doing this for more than 10 years. Wow, eerie, look at you guys. Um, let's say 10 to 20, sit down. All right, all right. Merci, Constantia. <laughs> Thank you for making the web what it is today, people who have been doing this for a long time. That was only a little sarcastic. You guys, you can sit down now. <laughs> okay, thank you for indulging me on that. So I'm going to make some assumptions about the people sitting in this room, and some of them might be more relevant than others, but the first thing I can say about all of you is that you're really smart. You are in this industry doing something that requires a lot of very difficult brain work. We're not, <laughs> we're not dummies here. Some people here may be smarter than others, but you know you're smart. You probably were one of the smartest people in school, even if you weren't good at school. You may or may not have gone to college, but the other thing I can probably say about you is most of you are white men. <laughs> like, sorry, it's true. <laughs> so you guys are at a tech conference on a Friday. It's a beautiful day outside, and you're, you're chilling in here listening to me talk about, you know, whatever. So I really can believe that everyone in this room wants to write good code. Like, you genuinely care about getting better at your craft. I can also say, because you're human, that you probably look at bad code and get judgy about it. <laughs> you, I mean, we've all had to maintain it. Um, we've also all been the person who had written the bad code. And you pull open a file, and you're like, what the hell is going on here? Like, what was this person smoking? And then you're like, oh god, I did this. This was me. <laughs> but the other thing I can say about all of you is that you all realize these things, too. And you may not realize them in a sense where, you know, you're going to get as in-depth about the feelings part of it as I'm about to. But, you know, as a, as a woman in tech, we have a lot of spa safe spaces to talk about the things I'm going to talk about today. About writing good code, about writing bad code, about feeling out of place, about being intimidated by how smart everyone is and how very, very much there is to learn. And I feel like 
white men, as we've established that most of you are, don't, don't get the chance to talk about that as much. And I think the industry's gotten a lot better about acknowledging underrepresented people and their struggles, but it's a struggle for all of us, really. And you know, I, I submitted this talk, and originally it was gonna be slightly more technical, and a couple months ago I was talking to one of the developers on my team. He, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much his direct supervisor, and I, although I wasn't at the time, I guess, but I'd asked him for help with a thing, and he's this amazing smart developer, and he helped me so much, like took time out between meetings, like probably skipped a lunch or something. So I called him on Twitter, and I'm like, oh yeah, he's brilliant. And the thing he said to me, like privately afterwards, was, LOL, too bad I'm an idiot. And that really, really resonated with me because I've spent so much time working with women to get over their feelings of you know, being an imposter in the industry, but I realized like, this is a person that I think is brilliant and he thinks he's an idiot sometimes. And I mean, I know he also knows that he's really smart, but I was like, wow, okay, this is, this is a problem for, for everyone. And there just aren't secret like societies and Slack channels to talk about it like women have. So we're gonna talk about it today. So one of the things we're going to talk about is reactive versus proactive coding and kind of why we do each. So reactive, obviously, is you are reacting to something. Either, hey, project manager told you to do this thing, or you know, the scope changed, or oh god, there's a bug I need to fix. It's just you know, reacting to past events compared to proactive, where you're looking at the future. You're looking at problems that might arise. You're you know, looking at other things people have told you are best practices, and you're writing code in that way. And there's no reason that you can't kind of do both at the same time, but it's a spectrum, and I have graphs later with my face on them, so you guys will see those. So we're also gonna talk a little bit about good code versus bad code, and I'm not going to give you a ton of opinions about what is good code or what is bad code. We're gonna look at why we write bad code, and sometimes it's not the reasons that we think when we're being really like awful and judgy about it. And we're gonna talk about feelings, sorry. I know I'm like, it was a bit of a bait and switch, there was not the word feelings in the, in the like talk summary, but we're gonna do it anyway. And I'm probably gonna just like make fun of lots of stuff and drop profanity because I have a huge mouth, so um, I'm sorry if I offend anybody, you can at me on Twitter and I can you know, pretend I'm important, so that'll be fun too. So I was writing this talk and, oh no, Kanye broke everything. So, oh, this is blurry. So, Kanye did not actually write these tweets in case anyone doesn't get the joke. It says, <laughs> early optimization the real evil. You are not gonna need it. Don't repeat yourself. Individuals, interactions over processes and tools. Okay, so, we're gonna go through a hypothetical project manager asks a hypothetical programmer, this is going to be a fun talk if this is coming in and out, to just print hello world, just like a really simple feature, like it's, you know, we estimate it's not supposed to take long, just print hello world. So, oh my god. So, stage one, you are a new programmer, you don't know what you're doing, you just got your first job and you are terrified and you are asked to print hello world. So you Google it and you write a class and you write a function and it prints it and you see it on the screen and you're like, I did it. And you put it in, you know, Jira or Trello that you did it and you move on and you're proud of yourself. But you know, you don't really overthink it. You're not trying to think about like, okay, well what, you know, if this feature expands, what if there are problems? Once you've been in it for a while, and you know more about how to write code, you know more about the things that you're supposed to do, so you might interpret, like what if, what if someday we don't wanna say hello world, what if we wanna say howdy world? You know, what if, what if we wanna switch out anything else? So we, we're gonna have an interface, basically, with just these methods that we have to call. And this is also pseudocode, so if you guys see like syntactical errors, don't judge me, I didn't actually like, run this anywhere. <laughs> so, and we have a try-catch, like what if it fails? And we have like all this extra stuff just to print hello world. And then you become the mid-level developer, and this is why I said those like one to three year people are gonna feel a little attacked, because you know you do some of this. And this is all one class, by the way, I had to break it up because it was so much. Um, so we've got like, okay, well we're gonna break them into different constants and we're going to put them both in the constructor so we can just say how, what, howdy or whatever else. Like really, really easy. Look how easy this is. I have getters and setters. Oh, also we created a microservice because reasons and we have a client that calls it and I actually gave a talk on microservices once. Um, so some of you who have been at Laracon like know that I'm actually really making fun of myself pretty hard right now because I don't do them anymore. Um, <laughs> so like you set the greeting and then print it, but there's like, I mean, I don't even know how many lines of code because I don't have that, but I mean, it's like 80 lines of code to print hello world, like this really simple thing. And then maybe you get to this point, maybe you don't, but you get to the point where it's, you're like, all right, I'm getting this done. I just need to print hello world. I don't need to overthink this. I introduced like three bugs the last time I tried to do this. This is ridiculous. So you just print hello world. 
So we're gonna talk about these three different stages that we go through. I know it's four things and it's not, it bothers me it doesn't line up. I really wanted the like different examples. So we're gonna talk about junior developers. So I got my first junior developer job. I was just about to finish my master's degree. I'd done some freelance work doing WordPress stuff. I knew a little bit of Rails and I did not like doing the freelance WordPress stuff because it's like when you're doing like the $300 sites, it's a race to the bottom, it's really bad. <laughs> so I was at this Ruby meetup in Chicago and I met um, this guy who told me his company was hiring Rails devs and like at a junior level, I was like, yes, and he got me an interview and I get, I get in and they hire me and then they're like, oh yeah, and we're, we're gonna have you do some WordPress stuff. That was a year and a half I did that. Although I say that, but like most of those cool clients I had up there, you guys recognized, like were actually WordPress sites. And they were, I mean, big WordPress stuff. So that was, I mean, I learned a lot. And I learned a lot about like scalability and stuff too. So I don't know how many of you use WordPress here, but basically, I mean, you, you can be a better WordPress developer than this, but a lot of times you're just like customizing this theme on top of WordPress and you've got one file that's called functions.php and functions.php it's a dark, scary place. It's like 2,000 lines. There's just like code that doesn't even like exist anywhere else anymore. And just like one, and you might have like a scripts.js. <laughs> it's really bad. It's, and again, you can be a better WordPress developer. And this is not me making fun of WordPress, but this is a way, you, I've seen enough WordPress code to know this is how it, how it goes. So we got a client that was not going to do be, like work for WordPress stuff. And our Rails team was really tied up. So they're like, all right, Samantha, you're on this, figure it out. And I'm like, hey, I've heard a lot about this framework Laravel, which is kind of like Rails without all the sanctimony. It's like for PHP developers who hate themselves anyway. So, and I knew a little bit about Rails, and I'm like, yes, instead of having this one big file, I can do, you know, model view controller, and it's gonna be really organized and great, and I don't have to fight against posts and pages, and I'm really excited about this. So, <laughs> My code was, I mean, I, I didn't, this was my first, you know, real non-WordPress project, and it was just like, yep, I have all these controllers, and I'm just doing all this stuff in the controllers, but it works, and it's great. Actually, it was a horrible project. We were working, like, 80 hours a week. I, it was bad. But anyway, it was, it was great not doing WordPress, and I was really excited about, like, moving on in my career. But it was very reactive coding. I was just trying to figure out what I was doing, even when I was doing the WordPress stuff, and you know, I would get code reviews, and you know, but it was always like, I just need to get this to work. That's, that's my goal right now. I just want to get this to work without bugs, and hopefully they don't realize that I don't know what the hell I'm doing and fire me, because I don't want to go back to making like $26,000 a year, because I have student loans my master's degree also now. It's a problem. So I got through this big Laravel project and um, got hired by a startup. And they had been on Shark Tank and just hired their first couple of engineers. Um, and it was really cool. Like, so we had like all these different Laravel microservices and you know, I was learning a lot. I was working with this guy who was like completely brilliant and been doing this a long time and he taught me a lot. And I also started like, I really wanted to get good at this. And I started reading about design patterns. I read about Gang of Four. I was building all this like, all this stuff. And I was reading stuff like this that made me feel really bad about myself. Like, <laughs> looking back at my previous project, and I was like, why would you have, why would you have your ORM and your controllers? Like, what do you, and like, people on Twitter just get so angry about best practices. And I took it really personally. Like, oh God, I'm a bad developer. I need to not be a bad developer. I need to make sure I'm coding proactively and using these design patterns. And this is the point it got to. It's really bad, you guys. Like, you're all gonna judge me right now. So. I had like a, a controller, say like user controller, just to you know get a list of users. But the controller has to call a service, right? Like the controller should only care about like figuring out what happens when you hit a route. And if this is like gibberish to anybody, I promise this is about as technical as it gets. Um, and from there, I call the command bus because you know the service shouldn't really worry about what's doing either. The service should just be what the controller uses to figure out what's going on here. And then, well, what if, you know, I want to switch out my database or something? Like, we should, that's where database logic lives. It's in a repository, so I'd have, like, a get all or get one or paginate. Like, I'd have all these things, and that's where I'd have my actual model logic. So that's where you would have, like, user all. And they're, oh, I use interfaces, too, because you never know if you're going to have to switch it out. Basically, an interface, like I said before, is just like a contract with, okay, these are the methods you need, and if you need to switch out an implementation, theoretically, you don't have to change a lot of code. I mean, that's... That's not how it works. Don't let anybody lie to you. <laughs> I mean, literally, this was like a get users, guys. It was, it was like, just, I mean, I could have literally just had users all on my controller and had one line of code and I have like five classes. 
So, oh, come on, there we go. I felt like this. I felt like, yeah, I can just like switch stuff out. It's gonna be great. Look what a good developer I am. But like, it's still Jenga, right? <laughs> it's still a problem. So WTF was I thinking. I haven't dropped an F-bomb yet, I'm so proud. So it's like, classes should only ever have one responsibility. That means I need six classes to do a thing. What if I want to replace my ORM or some other implementation detail? Also, I had literally like 99% test coverage, which is a meaningless metric, but I bragged to anyone. Grandma, guess what I have? <laughs> and I'd be like, because we have all these microservices, like I might need to get a list of users or something else, and I can just like queue it and run it in the backgrounds, and I'm so future-proof, everyone's gonna think I'm smart. Look at me. And yeah, that smirk emoji is like, literally the face I feel like I would make when I would talk about my code. But it was, I mean, I was an architecture astronaut. Like, I was so proud of myself for something that just, like, but it was a, such a pain to maintain. Like, I wanted to change something. I have to change, like, six places. And, like, I had test coverage, so I knew if it was failing. But it still just took so much time to write and to fix and to maintain. And, oh, my God, trying to explain it to another developer. Even though I had that face the whole time, they'd just be like, it just, this is to get users? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. But there were other things I was thinking too. And I was worried about my lack of computer science degree. You know, a lot of why I spent so much time reading about design patterns and feeling insecure on Twitter was because I'm self-taught. I'm sure a lot of you are too. And I was working with really brilliant people. Um, you know, we hired other developers who somehow ended up underneath me on the chain and it was like, oh my God, like they know all these things. Like, am I ever gonna catch up to all of these things that they know? Although, I mean, guys, you saw the Jenga. It was pretty cool. <laughs> but it was this constant, like, I'm, I'm the dumbest person on this team, and if they find out, like, it, my career's over. And that was a lot, like, just really looking back at it. I think that was, that, was, that was my reason for the bad code, were these insecurities. Also because Jenga, but also because of this. I wasn't writing it necessarily because it was the right thing to do. I was writing it because I was trying to future-proof, and I was trying to use all of these fancy tricks that I spent so much time learning. So imposter syndrome is something, like I said, that women talk about a lot in our safe, secret spaces. And if any of you women in the crowd are like, what is she talking about? I'll get you an invite. Let me know after, after the talk. But it's a problem. It's a problem for all of us. And it's something that I now, as a senior, like talk to my developers about, most of whom are white men, some of whom aren't. And it's something that we all do deal with. And imposter syndrome is basically, for any of you who aren't familiar, thinking that you are an imposter. Um, you basically are putting on this front that you know what you're doing. And a lot of times, because you're smart, and you know you're smart, you do know what you're doing. But also, there's so much to learn in this industry, and it changes so, so fast. And you can't know it all. No matter how smart you are, no matter how long you've been doing it, you know, maybe you'll get to the point where you're like, yeah, I know all these things, but there's all this new stuff, and these kids just jump in at these boot camps and learn it. And I don't, I mean, you're always going to have that insecurity, because you're a human. So when I was a mid-level developer, I went too far in the other direction. I was trying so hard to code for the future. And I mean, some of it too, like you're in a startup and there's this really fun energy, like, yeah, we're gonna you know, be the next unicorn, billion dollar company, and my 0.022 valuation is gonna be worth at least like $200,000, and it's gonna be great. So I, went, I did go too far in the other direction and tried to be too proactive. And I wasn't looking at the tasks, which were get a list of users, and <laughs> just getting a list of users. I was making the crazy hello worlds. So I ended up leaving that startup and I um, got my current job at this company called Titan. And I work for this man named Matt Stauffer, which I should have put his Twitter on here, I didn't. He's brilliant. And he saw my propensity to do this and just like nipped it in the bud and just shut that down. And it was probably the best thing that's ever happened to me in my career. And I realized that, because it's again, I'm doing you know, client work, so I have the opportunity to try out a lot of different things. And I still have the propensity to do it. You know, I learn about Redux, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm building this React app, and I'm going to have like 18 like, packages to, it's like, no, I mean, I'm just, I have components, it's fine. I don't need you know, to spend two weeks setting it up. But you know, now that I'm senior level, I don't do as much day-to-day -day code. I spend a lot of time talking to developers and keeping them from doing these things. And I've seen these things go wrong on both sides where you don't look at the future or you do look at the future too much. And a lot of my job now is just basically doing what Matt did to me in the day and just being like, yeah, let's, let's, 
this is cool, I know we're excited, but like, let's, let's take it back. So I don't have it figured out. Like, I probably will give this talk in a year and this would move in a different direction on the slider, but a lot of what I have figured out is that, you know, good code and bad code, no one is lazy here. No one here is writing bad code because they don't care. People are writing bad code for other reasons. And one of the most important things I had to learn as someone who now spends a lot of her job giving code reviews, you're not your code. And it's really hard to separate yourself from the code that you write, especially if things go wrong and things break and you know, bugs are introduced or someone's like, why would, you, why would you put this in your controller? This should be in this other place. How did you not know this? And it's really, really easy to take it personally, but you're not your code. If you, you know that you're putting in your good work and you're trying to learn, and you look back on your code six months ago and it sucks, that's a good thing. That means that you've gotten better and it means that you've learned. So, how to be a good developer. I think a really important thing that we all have to do is to try not to judge others for bad code because you don't know what they were thinking when they wrote it. And it probably wasn't that they were lazy and trying to make your life miserable right now, it's probably that they were <laughs> really trying to write good code and made a mistake because they didn't know better, or they were under some sort of time deadline, or weren't given the chance to refactor because they were just pushed onto the next thing by a stakeholder. That's something that in client work I have to really take a step back and remind myself to do sometimes because we, we see some stuff, we see some stuff that haunts me in my nightmares. But this also does include yourself. It's really important to not let yourself be held back by the mistakes that you made because it is a really easy thing to do and it can push you to make other mistakes trying to like preemptively avoid them again. And I know we already went back to like the, the white male thing, but you know, so you guys, we, we all acknowledge these are all struggles we all deal with. The people who are underrepresented do deal with this in a, in a more different way because we are trying to just hit that level and feel like we're being scrutinized. So do keep that in mind also in your interactions with other people. I get to be on my like feminist on stage and preach at you guys right now, but it's, it's a really important thing. And another really important thing is to share what you've learned. And I don't necessarily mean getting on stage at a conference and talking about it, but although that is really fun and you get to like travel around the country and get put up in nice hotels, so I do recommend it. Um, <laughs> but it's important to share what you've learned, the good and the bad. We, we get excited about things and we go in our Slack and we're like, hey coworkers, look at this cool new thing I discovered. But it's important to share your mistakes as well and to normalize them because we all do make them and there is a lot to be learned from, from mistakes, from other people's mistakes. And I told you guys this was, this was a feelings talk, so. Um, but the more technical version, how do you be a good developer? How do you avoid making these mistakes? Ask questions. And it's hard when you know that you're smart and you're holding yourself to that smart person standard and you know that everyone else is smart and you're trying to look as smart as them, it's hard to be vulnerable and say, I don't, I don't understand this. I, don't, I want to talk through the scope. So you have to ask a lot of questions about the requirements and that can help you determine, do I need to be proactive here about coding for the eventualities or can I just print hello world on the screen and move on? Because they're not going to want to say howdy, it's hello world, it's fine. And kind of, kind of along that, being able to just bounce ideas off of other developers, and you know, that might be people on your team. Um, meetup groups are a great resource for that as well. Or, I mean, people on Twitter, if you just kind of are like, I, I have a question about this thing. Are, everyone in this community is so welcoming and so helpful. And you, you, know, you see somebody else asking a question, you're not, you don't judge them necessarily for asking it, but it's really easy for us as smart people to feel judged. And one thing that, this is the thing that you guys are gonna wanna talk to me about later, I feel, but <laughs> there isn't shame in writing code that you know might change someday and needs to be refactored. You will never know less about the future than you do when you write that code. And if you have to go through and refactor later because you didn't predict the future, but I mean, it's not like it's broken, like I'm not saying, you know, good code is broken code, but that's okay. You can let your code base tell you what it needs. If you're, you know, repeating logic, yeah, maybe, maybe at that point, extract it into some sort of service or helper class. Um, you know, if you, you really are like, there is a concrete reason that we're gonna have to switch this thing out, yeah, maybe reach for an interface or another design pattern or a factory. But you don't need to worry about that until it happens because things change. That startup that I worked for, I, I wrote all this stuff like, okay, you know, we're gonna get big and we're gonna, they ended up pivoting. They ended up building a completely different platform. Like, from the ground, all this code that I wrote like is probably not even in existence anymore because they do something completely different now in order to raise more funding. So all this time I spent worrying about the future was literally for nothing because now they do something different. But at the end of the day, and this is really the feely part, like we are all in this together. And it's important that we remember that when we're reading other people's code, when we're talking about our code. And you know, like I said, women talk to me about the secret Slack group, it's so cool. 
So that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you guys learned a thing or two and are in your fields now going into the next talk. But if you do want to talk to me, there's my Twitter. Um, my company's Twitter. We have a lot of cool blog posts and stuff, so you should definitely give us both a follow. And have an awesome rest of your conference. Thanks, Matt, for putting this all together.